Welcome to the first live podcast of Brand the Interpreter. I am your host, Mireya Perez, and I am thrilled to be here today and have the opportunity to take part in this sure to be interesting discussion, or at the very least, eye opening, I hope. But before I introduce today's guests, I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsors for today's live podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Liberty Language Services and its new sister company, the Academy of Interpretation, that launched in early 2022. The Academy of Interpretation is an online education and learning platform for the language services industry. The AOI's mission is to expand access to educational courses while maintaining a standard of quality and professionalism. They do this by bringing language service providers, content creators, and students together on an online platform that's accessible to everyone. The Academy of Interpretation was founded to address the widespread problem of untrained interpreters working in the field. The AOI offers professional accredited courses for interpreters and serves as a platform for organizations to refer their interpreters for training. The AOI is offering Brand the Interpreter listeners a 10% discount on all courses using the discount code AOI10BTI. This code cannot be combined with any other discounts. So head on over to their website to find out more about AOI at www.academyofinterpretation.com. All right. Thanks to our sponsors. And uh, now we are on with the show. So before I get to introduce our first guests, you guys don't even understand how excited I am that we are here live with you today. I want to go ahead and en enable the uh, chat overlay just so that I make sure that if there is anyone that would like to include anything uh, with regards to the chat, we are able to share that with the rest of the audience. So Going on over to the introduction of our guest. Our very first guest today is a 28-year-old online student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He was born, raised, and currently lives in Guayaquil, Ecuador. As two of his mother's siblings married people from the United States, he has always had the interest in communicating with his cousins and other extended family. As nobody else was really interested in being able to communicate with both sides of the family, he took it upon himself to teach himself enough to have a conversation. This, alongside media he consumed while growing up, helped him to consolidate and curate his interest in learning languages, which eventually led him to pursue a degree in localization at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Please help me welcome Alvaro Cepeda to the show. Welcome, Hi, Hello, thanks for being here today. Happy to be here today. Our next guest is Leron Esau. He is a CCHI and CMI certified Spanish medical interpreter. He is state court certified in a number of states and actively pursuing federal court and ATA translator certification. Leron is also a localization student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Leron, welcome to the show. Hi, Maria. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. And last but certainly not least is Dr. Lawrence J. Ram Ibrahim Aibo. She holds a PhD in translation studies from Université de Montréal. She is an OTT IAQ certified translator and a core certified CCHI healthcare interpreter and has been translating, teaching and interpreting in the Americas, Europe and Africa for the past 30 years. Dr. Ibrahim Aibo designs translation and interpreting curricula for international organizations and currently teaches in the online certificate in professional TNI program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and in the online MS in TNI at NYU. She is the author of The Politics of Translating Sound Motifs in African Fiction and co-author of The Rutledge Guide to Teaching Translation and Interpreting Online. Please help me welcome Dr. Ibrahim Aibo to the show. Professor, welcome. 
Thank you very much, Miriam, for this introduction. It's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much. Super excited to have all of you here today. And I'd like to first begin by getting to know uh, our guests a little bit more. So we're going to go ahead and open this discussion by, you know, we can't start this podcast by not getting to know who it is that we're speaking with. So I'd like to begin first with Alvaro. Alvaro, beginning with you, would you please share a bit about yourself and how you came to find the TNI program that you're currently enrolled in? Yes, sure. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, my issue with uh, looking for um, a college education was that I wanted to go to the United States, uh, mostly because my family lives there, but uh, I was denied a student visa. So my, my only opportunity to, to have a college education in the United States was through UMass Amherst. Uh, through their, it's actually a very affordable and flexible education program. So I've been, I've been treated very well and I've been learning a lot in only the past two years since the pandemic started. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. And you are from currently uh, connecting all the way from Ecuador, is that correct? Correct. It, Guayaquil is basically like the New York of, of Ecuador. You know, all the businesses and it's a main port and all that. Very exciting. Super excited to have you. Thanks so much for being here. Next, we'll go on over to Laurent. Laurent, would you like to share a bit more about yourself and your career as a language professional? Thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to speak a little bit. Yes, um, I uh, arrived at the U.S. Uh, at the uh, UMass Amherst program um, a little bit in a non-traditional way. Um, I, as a working professional in the language uh, services industry, uh, as you mentioned in your in my bio, uh, I am medically certified and and I work in the state court system as a uh, judicial interpreter. Uh, but as you mentioned, also uh, began to pursue federal. Uh, uh, in, uh, certification and also the the ATA certification. So I was searching for uh, training that would would give me a, a really solid foundation as I you know prepare for these different exams. Um, amongst uh, many other uh, programs that I investigated, I was really impressed with the U, uh, UMass Amherst program. Uh, it's been uh, all that it was built to be, and and I've uh, learned tremendous amount of. Of information and and it was a pleasure to to uh, to work on this project in particular. Yeah, and we're gonna get into what that project was and what you guys ended up unraveling. But before we get to that, uh, Professor Lawrence, if you would be so kind as to share also a bit about yourself and how the this project that led Alvaro and Laurent to present on this issue even came to be. Hmm. Yeah, so um, actually it has to do with the way I learn myself um, I, because we learn uh, our entire life long and I do happen to listen to a number of podcasts, including yours, and I was looking for a new type of final project in uh, the course um, I was teaching last spring, um, Ethics and Standards of Practice, and I didn't want to assign another presentation or paper because I found them boring and less relevant nowadays. Um, so I decided to design um, a, a final project as a 10 minute podcast in small teams of two or three people. And this is how this came to life. And I was, uh, um, I was flabbergasted by, by some of the projects, including this beautiful project. Yes, and beautiful project it was because what was the uh, actual um, request that you had given the students for the project, Professor? So um, the final project in this course is always uh, focusing on ethical dilemmas. So students have to identify an ethical dilemma. Sometimes it's more difficult than we think um, because the dilemma is not right versus wrong. This is very easy. Uh, we know with codes of ethics what course of action we should take. It's when we have an imperfect solution or course of action versus a less imperfect solution or course of action. A, a complex situation where there's, there's always a gray area and there's some, some uh, some some depth to it to engage in uh, critical analysis and critical thinking. 
Yeah, and I think I think definitely um, this particular project that was presented by your uh, team of students uh, definitely hit that mark. And if you're probably wondering, well, what was the project or what did they submit? I'd like to share with you a very short clip as to what they ended up submitting. It was longer than what I'm about to share, but you know, this gives us the gist of uh, what the ethical dilemma was. So I'm going to go ahead and play that clip for you as a request or maybe more accurately an ultimatum from russia google has requested that its translators no longer use the word war to re refer to the ukraine uh situation or the, or the war in, in ukraine rather it's being uh, uh requested that it be referred to as and i quote an extraordinary circumstance so okay like that seems like maybe not that big a deal to some or maybe it's not as it, like well explained i don't know so let's get into um what this means like was it difficult first and foremost to Laurent and alvaro to come to a consensus about the project that you wanted to submit or was this just like a game changer and a definite please Laurent. well uh alvaro and i uh, had several discussions about uh projects that uh, would be uh, good candidates for for our final project we didn't want to to choose a, a generic or a um, textbook style uh, case study uh, of what an ethical dilemma would be a patient arrives at a at a at a uh, emergency room and and there's the ethical dilemma uh, regarding the uh, direct the medical directive or or something like that we wanted uh, to find something that was really relevant, something that was really um, nuanced. And uh, this one, uh, amongst a number of other subjects that we talked about, uh, this one really kind of uh, fit all of the requirements that we were looking for. Yeah, and Alvaro, who ended up stumbling upon the, the articles? How did, that, how did that come to be? Uh, that actually took a lot of time. Um, we decided barely one month before submission. So um, it was just week after week of looking for new articles about something relevant to our, uh, to our industry, as well as uh, that require uh, met the requirements for the project. Um, and also I, I was like, Ron knows this. I was very like specific of, about finding something that was interesting, something that, uh, you know, would be get people interested into into it and, and was currently relevant. So I found this about the uh, the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine, that's it. And what about you, Professor Lawrence, when you came across the project that was submitted, what were your thoughts? Wow. <laughs> uh, I was I was blown away because um, usually um, interpreters encounter more ethical dilemmas than translators. So students end up focusing on and rightly so, on dilemmas uh, that interpreters face. So it's quite, um, it's more difficult for students to to select or to pick a topic that has to do with translation rather with, with interpreting. So immediately I was interested in what they had selected. And um, I, it was the first time I came across this, uh, this problem issue topic. Uh, so I was very curious to read about that, but I was most curious about and interested in the way that they uh, they dealt with the the topic. This was uh, something that was I was very impressed. Yeah, and how did you both deal with the topic? So for those that haven't had the opportunity to listen to the full project submitted, which by the way was how many minutes long that was uh, had to be submitted? What were the, what was those parameters? Laurent? Yeah, we had a 10 minute limit. So this was a, a subject that has a lot of teeth uh, and we wanted to you know, address it from uh, several uh, reconciling at the same time, a number of uh, ethical uh, standards of practice and code of ethics. And to do that within 10 minutes was, it was probably the largest challenge. Yeah, I cannot imagine trying to put in a topic into a 10 minute podcast. Like that's it, I'm already going over my one hour as it is when it's really good stuff. So 10 minutes, uh, condensing the content in 10 minutes, I, that in itself was, I'm sure, a challenge. 
aside from the fact that you guys had to meet, you know, the project parameters and deadlines and all of that, as professionals or soon to be professionals in the field, what other concerns came to mind as you're reading these articles? Go ahead, Alvaro, please. Uh, more so than the ethical concerns in paper, I was concerned about, uh, you know, the people in itself. So, um, and that's what I was, I would, uh, I was talking about later in my uh, podcast, specifically about what happened with the employees in, at Google, because they, they were relocated. I, I don't know if I'm going a little bit further than we should right now, but uh, that was my main interest that they, they are kept safe, which is, you know, before it comes before any kind of social political issue is that people are safe. Yeah. Yeah. The people, Laurent. Uh, from my perspective, uh, I, I really looked at it uh, from the linguistic point of view, and in, in that, um, as the professor um, mentioned at the outset, uh, ethical dilemmas and conundrums are really black and white. Uh, we lived in a, in a very complex society, and these these types of ethical issues um, are constantly emerging, uh, and they take on new shapes and new situations almost daily. When we look at the news, uh, different types of situations uh, could pose ethical dilemmas for those that work in the language services industry. So we wanted to, to take a real issue and, and show how it applies, not only uh, from a general sense, but a pragmatic sense also on the micro and, and the, the micro level, macro and micro levels uh, of the issue uh, as it pertains to you know, the companies involved, but also the language professionals. Yeah, the companies that are that are involved, especially, I think, because, you know, we're, we're thinking about, you know, um, uh, big, big names here, right? It's, it's, it's Google. Um, but what, what could that imply for the smaller, right? Like the smaller organization. So, which we'll get into in just a second. Alvaro, did you like to add something? No, just something really quick. Uh, since uh, uh, Laurent mentioned it, he tackled the issue in a micro level. I'll tackle it in from a macro level, specifically um, pertaining to what, to the branch of localization which is what, I'm, uh, what my college degree is gonna be about. So, um, so basically um, I was looking into us what the decisions from a company level are. Like mm -hmm. even, cause you know, you have your inner decisions and you also have what you disclose to the public. You have to consider many aspects at the same time. And since it's a war, you have to do it pretty quickly. So it's, it's it's a very complex ethical dilemma. Mm -hmm. Laurent? And, and the project does not uh, purport to indicate what a person should do in, in the specific ethical dilemma. Uh, what it does is highlight the need to be cognizant of ethical dilemmas, identify them, and then be able to apply uh, critical thinking ability and skills to be able to make ethical decisions. And so those decisions may differ, may vary from one uh, professional to another. Uh, depending on their circumstances, uh, their position, their their voice, et cetera. Uh, but uh, it, it just kind of highlights how uh, very, very nuanced uh, these these ethical dilemmas are uh, given the times we live in. Speaking of ethical dilemmas, perhaps this is a question for Professor Lawrence. What ethical principle for translators has been violated here in this particular scenario? Um, it um, I'm not saying that it is a specific principle that has been violated, but uh, translators are social beings, and um, what has been done is is borders on censorship, right? Uh, basically, a company is uh, telling uh, the staff that a particular word cannot be used. Um, now, uh, of course, we can uh, agree or disagree, but what is at hand is a war. A war is a war is a war. So it's difficult to go around and, and look for other words. Uh, and even though this is a very immediate situation, we are all uh, faced with this uh, situation and we are uh, living the news, listening to the news and the media uh, who are using the word war. So it's difficult as translators to uh, circumvent that particular terminology. We're talking about terminology. 
and uh, so it is a form of censorship but because we are uh, deep in the in the middle of this uh, crisis of this war it is difficult to immediately um, highlight or identify what is at stake right uh, we don't have a necessary distance to um, analyze uh, uh, a, a particular situation. It's easier, like in history, to analyze a situation that happened 20 years ago when they are in the thick of the, the problem of the issue, it is more difficult. So, yeah, and that potentially. And I'm sure Al, um, Alvaro and, and sorry for interrupting, uh, and Laron have more to say about that than, than myself. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I was just going to add, and particularly in retrospect, um, seeing it from the uh, eagle's view, right? Um, being able to see a beginning and an ending where we're, we're in the middle of it, like you just said, Professor Lawrence. Um, Alvaro, Laurent, is there anything else you would like to add, Laurent? Well, sure. Um, the, the core of the issue here is, um, that was brought out is not a word choice issue, uh, the, pra or the pragmatic uh, subject of, of the meaning of a word. Uh, it's linguistic integrity. And so uh, during the course of the ethics um, uh, course that, that we uh, participated in, uh, we analyzed 17 different codes of ethics and, and looked at them from different angles and so forth. And as it pertains to this particular uh, issue, what really stood out to me was um, a, a reference from the American Translators Association's Code of Ethics, where it mentions that ling linguistic integrity is at the core of what translators do. And so uh, the responsibility or the obligation of the translator is uh, to relay or to render uh, the source material in the same manner, uh, to have the same emotional impact on the audience as was intended by the source language or, or the source text. And so uh, even though we're talking about perhaps one word, uh, that altering, that shifting, that modifying of the source text does uh, does hinder, does filter, does uh, alter the emotional impact on, on its audience. I'm going to play a bit of a devil's advocate here and, and um, bring in when we, we are talking about source meaning, um, so preserving the meaning style and register, right, of that source document. Whose meaning in this case? Is it the author's meaning or is it the public's interpretation of the meaning? <laughs> Food for thought, Lebron. <laughs> well, I, that, that's a very, that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting um, the question. Uh, in this particular case, um, there was this is a, con, a, a, a carte blanche quest that any message uh, be filtered in this way, and so then it, it's uh, it doesn't take into regard um, the, the 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 source of the of the original message what their um, but what their message was, it's, it's um, basically filtering uh, any, any input that, that's coming through, you know, the Google um, machine, so to speak, uh, so as to alter, you know, the impact on its audience. And so uh, basically our posture or my posture was that as language professionals or as translators or as interpreters, it's not our job to get involved with political issues. Our, uh, our loyalty, our obligation is to, to the text. So, um, you know, that, that was the posture at which I, you know, approached it. In an article um, that was written by Jack Schofer that's entitled uh, Words Have Power uh, in uh, uh, Psychology Today, he states, uh, and I quote, words cannot change reality, but they can change how people perceive reality. Words create filters through which people view the world around them. Now, it's safe to say that companies have a say in the use of the terms that they'd like to use for their products or services, right? Like, say, accepted, translated uh, terms. But in this case, it goes beyond that, does it not? The choice of the words are changing the narratives uh, or would change the narrative if that is, in fact, what you know Google decided if, in fact, they decided, hey, this is this is where we're going to we're going to stay. We're going to continue changing the word war into an extraordinary circumstance. Um, what other implications do you feel uh, like this uh, can also have in the language industry? 
What are your thoughts on that, Alvaro? Yeah, uh, with my analysis during the um, the podcast, uh, I did play devil's advocate. I took uh, Google's side per se, and what? Yes, they are doing censorship, and that is um, morally bankrupt. Um, they did that to acquiesce to one demand and not all of Russia's demands. And I asserted that um, they did it so that they would protect their people, that the people working at Google. So in my case, um, I felt after reading everything about the case is that uh, they complied with one request and just, but only in the in the very specific uh, Russian region of, or let's say the Russian uh, language uh, services that they provide. Mm. Um, that it didn't translate into every other uh, of their products. So it's very specific, uh, location specific. And, uh, and yes, well, they, they did censor that. They were very clear in their main uh, policy in English that we, well, not clearly, they was clearly ambiguous, you know, to, to, to reserve any, any issues. Um, but they did specify that uh, that's only for clarification. The, the actual policy is the one in English. And, uh, and what, I, what I wanted to, um, to portray with this is that they, they were doing this to protect their translators because mm -hmm. um, from retaliation specifically. So because in case they, they might say something that angers the, the, the Russian uh, uh, regiment, they might um, incur into uh, you know, something really bad like uh, prison sentences or life sentences even. So um, it, it was like a measure to acquiesce to a power to, in order to protect the people. That was my posture. Mm. Thank you, Alvaro. Mm -hmm. Laurent? Well, and another layer uh, to that is the line between being a language professional and, and uh, a linguist and uh, their charge to concentrate on linguistic integrity. And then this sort of filtering, if, if Google were the author of the source text, then by all means they have you know the 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 authority to to kind of dictate how they want um, you know their their uh, source text uh, translated, but uh, these are documents uh, from that originate from other sources, uh, and so then uh, there is an altering of the text, there is a, a a modifying of the text, and so then that line is, is whether you're performing uh, work as a translator or as a linguist or if you're being a spin doctor or a fixer or an activist or a propaganda promoter. Uh, so uh, I think the codes of ethics and standards of practice are designed to isolate translators from those, those sort of repercussions. Um, I think translators should be insulated uh, from external biases. Through the course, we were taught to, to identify and recognize our own internal biases and then to make ethical decisions based on those, on those biases. Um, so I think this really kind of muddies the water, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, and and as I mentioned earlier, I mean we're 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 dealing with a giant here when it comes to you know um, the the type of company where this occurred. But what if we bring it down to the smaller scale companies um, and some that are perhaps not so inclined to to you know take. Uh, localization per se, you know, into consideration where this is just, you know, uh, a request coming from like an like internal policy, if you will. Um, what are you? What are your thoughts with regards to to translators and and how do you deal with internal policies versus you know our own um, uh, ethical principles that we should be abiding by? Well, that, mm -hmm, Laurent? If I may, that's precisely one of the, the, the subjects that we discussed in the course. Um, as a, as a ling language professional, translator and interpreter, one has the, the autonomy uh, oftentimes to, to make a decision w w as to accept a, a certain project or not. Um, those decisions oftentimes may have consequences um, and some of those consequences may be un uh, unintended, um, but that autonomy, it does exist. So. Uh, a person does have the right to to look at a, a situation, a project that is particularly a translation project, and and exercise that that autonomy uh, as to to whether or not you know he'll participate in in, in the project or no. 
Yeah, you're right. It comes down to that uh, individual decision at the end of the day, right? Um, do I want to do I want to hold uh, and be true and um, honor my ethical principles as um, you know a, a language professional, um, or do I want to abide by potentially the uh, company policy that is uh, requesting that, which could, in fact, like you just mentioned, Laron, have uh, potential consequences indeed, right? That could mean that they part ways, which then brings me to maybe the next issue that could arise, which is contracted translators maybe that um, may not necessarily be, and I'm not saying that this is in fact the case or what happened or what could happen, but uh, someone that maybe is not necessarily abiding by ethical principles as a translator and um, maybe going uh, abroad to be able to obtain uh, such service. Did you come across anything like that potentially or any of those types of dilemmas during your research? Uh, Alvaro? Mm -hmm. Specifically, not really but we did take that into consideration because um not all of the people it wasn't clarified in the articles about the, this case that if they were actually um uh, people working directly in google headquarters in russia uh so we, we were wondering yes if that uh, that could be that could you know go counter to their uh to their needs as, as people they could lose their 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 um I don't know. They could lose their, their work. They could lose their house, their their, uh, their safety, uh, and and that 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 was a that is still uh, an issue for people. There they have to acquiesce to what the, the the sorry to call it that the propaganda machine in Russia uh, wants to do, but but um but indeed it's it's uh it's worrying. Definitely, Laurent. Uh, to that end, you know, during the course of, of this ethics class, we, we did um, examine and read a number of carefully curated um, documents and articles regarding ethics and so forth. And there was one article that I thought uh, had a very resonating um, position. Uh, it was uh, authored by Tarina Bell, and the name of the article is Personal Ethics and Language Services. And it said, and I quote, translation is not the place for martyrs. And regardless of which jobs we accept, it's our job to do those jobs well. And so, again, I don't think anyone should run the risk of having their lives, their personal integrity, their their financial well-being jeopardized because they do the job well. Uh, not the place for martyrs. But again, it does kind of show the focus to concentrate on the linguistic aspects to, to do the job well. Yeah, it's very difficult. And, and I can only imagine being in a in a situation such as that to have to decide, right? Um, I'd like to bring in a special guest. Um, today's special guest is uh, uh, Professor Cristiano Massey. Uh, he's a senior lecturer and director of online translator and interpreter training from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And I'd like to welcome him uh, to the show to give a little bit of uh, perhaps his insight and share some of his thoughts. Professor, thank you for being here, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I am so proud of these two students of ours for engaging critically with such an important topic. Um, and for Professor Lohans for having designed this amazing class that you know uh, encouraged students to engage cri critically with the field of translation and interpreting, but also the professional side of it. And here, I think we are seeing an example of an ethical dilemma of um, you know, either you um, follow the directions of your commissioner. So we, we use the word commissioner for 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 the you know agencies that hire our work, and the uh, and the, the the personal dilemma of the and professional dilemma of keeping linguistic integrity, right? Um, and this is also a great example uh, that shows that translation does not happen in a vacuum. And it's not only about language. Uh, there are other forces, you know, involved in the production uh, of translation. And we see this, this powerful force of Google uh, trying to influence um, the work of translators. So I think this is great. And thank you so much, Mireya, for uh, having this podcast. 
Oh, no, thank you. Thank you, all of you, for the opportunity to even present it on this platform, because I think that, um, and just yesterday I had someone ask, is this something that could affect um, the interpreters or for translators? But I think that we always need to be, you know, cognizant of what is happening in the industry, T and I, right? Because what could affect one side could potentially affect the other. And so uh, it never hurts to, to just be well informed um, about what's happening uh, out there in the industry. Uh, for all of us involved. Uh, Professor Cristiano Massey, uh, and then I'll come back to you, Professor Lawrence, just what does this mean for students? The students, particularly uh, uh, your students of TNI and ethical standards of practice, is this going to be part, a part now of, uh, of your training or when you're doing your courses, you know, bringing, the, bringing this situation to light? What does this imply now for students of TNI ethics and standards of practice? Thank you. Thank you so much for asking that question. The, um, when we designed the certificate, we wanted to put ethics at the heart of the curriculum mm -hmm. because we strongly believe that because translation and in, in interpreting impact other people's lives, that students need to learn how to engage with these two activities uh, critically. So putting ethics at the heart of the program, and we designed one course that focuses only on ethics and, and standards of practice. Although they do see uh, ethics and standards in the other courses, we have one course that students dedicate the entire semester reading and uh, working on these issues. Uh, because it's extremely important, because uh, that's what we do. We, as Lohan's uh, Professor Aibo mentioned earlier, uh, translators and interpreters are social beings. We are in the world and, and everything that we do and put out there will have an impact on other people's lives. That's correct. Thank you. Professor Lawrence? Yes, I just wanted to go back to the notion of forces or power dynamics. This is an excellent example of power dynamics. You have a giant such as Google who sends a memo that um, the translators, maybe staff, maybe freelance translators um, are not to use the word war. But it's, it's not only about emotions, it's about facts and it's about the power dynamics, mm. who is the perpetrator mm. and, and who has to, um, ha has to go through this situation. So uh, calling um, extraordinary circumstances, uh, calling a war extraordinary circumstances is uh, to say the least, um, uh, transforming the, the reality, right? Um, so it's, and, and because it's a giant who gives this kind of, um, of, of sends this kind of, of memo and it's a media giant, right. it also impedes on the news we are going to read in what languages, etc. So it has tons of ramification. This is enormous. The, the, the topic that Alvaro and Naron have identified and, and analyzed has um, multiple ramifications. And yes, the 10 minute format was absolutely not sufficient to, to discuss <laughs> it, but they did a wonderful job being very concise and going straight to the uh, essential points. Oh, definitely. And and to leave you hungry for more and going in search of more information yourself, which I'm completely uh, taken aback that there is uh, very little information actually out there with regards to this particular topic. And, and, you know, I'd love to have the opportunity to even ask those translators, like, what what was that like um, for them? Going back to the changing of the term from uh, war to extraordinary circumstance in the reading of the articles, I also identified that one of the other terms that that, you know, was um, being requested to be uh, transferred to a different uh, term uh, was the use of special military operation in lieu of the word invasion, which I found very interesting. Now mm -hmm. we're talking about special military uh, um, operation in an extraordinary circumstance. It's wow, so vague, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, what is really happening. Um, I'd like to give the opportunity, uh, Professor Cristiano Massey, you mentioned a, about the TNI certificate program at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and I'd like the opportunity for you to talk a little bit more about the program in general, because I think that, you know, it's one of the things that caught my attention um, with, with this obviously interesting topic was the fact that the professor was using uh, 
up to date, real relevant uh, content that was able, be, students are able to practice and use, like for example, podcasting, which may not necessarily be as popular for the younger generations, maybe, I don't know. Um, but, but I'm saying, you know, it's an ability to use your other skill sets in addition to really want to get into uh, some research having to do with this particular project. So if you would be so kind as to sharing a little, more, a little bit more about the program. Sure, thank you. Um, so we have a 15 credit online certificate. It's fully online and it's asynchronous um, with weekly modules and weekly deadlines for submission of assignments. Um, and uh, students can complete this 15 credit um, certificate in about a year, maybe three semesters, because we, we most of our students are adult learners with busy lives and and full time jobs and family commitments. Uh, so we encourage them to take, you know, two courses the most per semester um, because you have such a busy life. Uh, but we also have uh, because I don't know if you know this, Mireya, but a lot of folks in our uh, industry uh, practicing translators and interpreters. Uh, also, you know, started in the field without any training and sometimes have not completed a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So our 15 credit uh, certificate is also offered as an online concentration in, in our fully online interdisciplinary studies bachelor's degree offered by UMass Am Amherst and the division is called University Without Walls. Um, they accept credits, prior credits that you have. Maybe you, you've done some college, uh, community college work, or maybe took one college class. And they also accept your professional experience uh, uh, to be turned in a portfolio. And, and then that is also get, gets transformed into credits. So it's also, we have these two avenues for folks um, who want to, um, you know, further their studies and, and engage more critically with the field. And um, in terms of um, your question about now, it just I just lost my th train of thought. Um, do you remember what um, technology what aspects I'm bringing in? Yes, <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Because our uh, courses are fully online and asynchronous, we faculty members, directors, we meet every month to discuss about what are the new ideas for uh, online students, what are the things that are going to engage them online, and we're always reading up on the latest uh, pedagogic, um, you know, tools available uh, for students. And uh, Lohans's idea of using podcasts is, is just an example of that, of the engagement with uh, teaching. Um, you know, you mentioned in the beginning, Lohans and I just published a book on um, on teaching uh, translation and interpreting online as well. Um, so, and so we apply all of that in, in the, in our courses. Which I have, and it's on my uh, to read list, by the way, just throwing it out there. I allowed that opportunity for bringing in uh, what this TNI program is all about, guys, because um, you always hear me talking about um, the training aspect being so important in the field. I mean, it just opens up your eyes to situations such as this and what the industry is having to deal with. It, you know, regardless of whether you're coming in um, specializing in one thing or another, um, I think that if you're going to consider yourself a professional in the language, language industry um, you know we we need to be we need to be trained and we need it we need to hear about these very relevant topics so that's why I'm bringing in that conversation about the certificate program but going back to this this uh, uh, topic with lots of teeth to use Laurent's uh, phrase here um, what other implications can can uh, uh, we've talked about the implications that could happen in the language industry but what could it what could it teach us for the future of the workforce? And here, I, you know, anybody that would have a say, uh, please feel free to jump in. Laurent? Well, one of the great things about the course has been uh, the exposure to other medium. Uh, for example, uh, audio, visual translation, uh, subtitling, you know, voiceover work. And, and you can see how these types of issues could leak into different, you know, forms of, of the language industry, um, especially um, nowadays, these, these different um, aspects of the TNI industry are, are really growing, uh, and a lot of um, companies are 
are really looking for um, folks that are trained in localization, folks that are trained in audiovisual translation and, and so forth. And so uh, to be cognizant uh, and, and able to, to break down situations that, that emerge in a constantly you know, evolving work situation and work environment uh, is a fundamental, really fundamental tool. Most definitely. We have somebody from the audience here that is saying, uh, Cloudzer Technology says, could we really blame Google in this situation, though, since they might be protecting their translators, right? So maybe in some cases, the well-being of the people might be greater than professional ethics. I think uh, I think we did touch on this uh, quite a bit ago. Alvaro had talked about really wanting to focus on the aspect of, of the individual, right, um, as opposed to um, you know, necessarily sticking by professional, the professional ethics. And Iran, you mentioned it as well, right? Really making that decision there uh, where it comes down to the individual, of course, knowing what your professional ethics are. And eventually, I think, you know, at the end, at the close, I will, I, I will share that um, what Google decided to do in the end. So it's not like it was just left, you know, at, at this and, and people had to um, ignore it, right? Um, so Alvaro, you wanted to add yeah, something uh, really, really small. Uh, in some of the readings that, that we did uh, was about um, translators or forced translator um, interpreters, I mean, during World War II. Usually they were people that uh, of Jewish descent that they were forced to interpret against their own people. Mm. And that, it's really reminiscing, re reminiscent of this case because um, you have, in one way, you have people that Oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, but basically, it's about uh, having um, you consider people ethics, human ethics, uh, separate from professional ethics. Is that correct? Is that not correct? It's for you to decide. It, it's something that you need to take into account because professional ethics or uh, human ethics would only take you so, uh, so long. You have to take both into consideration in this type of uh, issues. Yes, absolutely. Laron? And another layer uh, to the discussion that we we talked about uh, on the podcast and, and kind of vetted a little bit uh, has to do with the financial implications that uh, acquiescing to this type of request may have for big corporations like Google that may have business interest in Russia. And mm -hmm. so, uh, you know, there's machine translation term bases where they generate literally hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for uh, for companies. And so uh, is it truly just a, a humanitarian interest or are there other interests that are not so transparent at play? Professor Cristiano, please. I was just going to add that um, part of the, the um, making the decision of what to do with an ethical dilemma is to take some time to think about the consequences of your action. Right. I, I said uh, earlier about mm -hmm. whatever we do is going to impact people's lives. And it's not only other people, but also yourself. Right. You have to think about the consequences. And that's what we mean when we say we want our students to engage with translation and interpreting um, critically. Yes, absolutely. And I mean, as you're going through these studies to have something so relevant that usually, you know, you're going to school and you're doing research and it's stuff that's happened in the past, like uh, Professor Lawrence had uh, mentioned in the beginning. So we're able to look in retrospect and what could we do, but here it's something in real time that's actually still occurring. And so, you know, very relevant to this day and age and what we could potentially encounter as we enter the profession, um, you know, and, and the companies that we're going to be working with. Uh, uh, Professor Lawrence? Yes, uh, what Alvaro just said about the conflict, um, the conflict, here I am, uh, modifying my terminology <laughs> for myself, uh, the, the war, the Second World War, which was a, a, a huge conflict. Um, and it reminded me of this beautiful mo movie by Roberto Benini, uh, Life is Beautiful, where the uh, Benini plays the role of the father of a little boy, they are in a concentration camp. And at some point he has to interpret, he's forced to interpret uh, the orders barked by this German uh, officer and to protect um, his people, his community, and his little boy, because he wants the little boy to believe that it's a game, he interprets something completely different. Uh, 
So he interprets, oh, he, these are the rules of a game. You will do this and you will do that. So this is also, uh, this is exactly what we're talking about in, in, in fiction, but um, this is an illustration of things that we have to do sometimes uh, as interpreters or translators to protect, uh, to protect people from immediate harm. Mm. So, um, if you haven't um, seen that that movie and this particular scene, it's very touching and it's very um, thought provoking about the power we have to protect people from harm at some very specific moment. Yes, I, it, what's coming to mind is uh, the interpreter um, that uh, we you know we saw on a lot of articles um, just recently. Um, you know, with the emotion that she had as she's interpreting, right? Mm -hmm. um, the 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 power uh, the power of words going back to that um, we talk a lot about the issue and what you know it, its potential implications what are some potential solutions moving forward for maybe for students or just for the workforce or um, anyone in general for the audience that's here today uh, what are some of those potential solutions that we could be looking into in, in preparation of potentially something like this continuing to happen um, because we you know we don't know right. Um, anybody like to chime in on any potential solutions or, or cons things to consider as we move forward? Yes, Laurent, please, and then Professor Lawrence. Well, I, I, as we mentioned earlier, um, ethics is not a, a black and white subject, right? There's a gray area. There's there's um, uh, personal circumstances that come into play and in, in situational uh, situational. Uh, issues that that factor into place, and we live in an ever evol evolving world. So the, this situation uh, perhaps could mutate and 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 transform itself into another type of conundrum. The idea is to to have a very clearly defined ethics, and then to uh, be uh, to be um, able to identify things that challenge those ethics, and and then be able to make decisions. Uh, to reconcile those two factors. Definitely, thank you, Professor Lawrence. Uh, I'm, I mean, just to answer your your question about how can we better prepare, I I think we all need to um, professionals need to really engage with ethics, uh, with readings, with trainings, with very specific trainings. Uh, let's talk about uh, machine translation and ethics. It's a huge field. It's a huge area uh, because all the talk about machine translation nowadays is what it can do, etc. And but what it does to on the many levels is little addressed and this needs to be addressed also in an ethics uh, course so the more we read the more we engage with um, conundrums or dilemmas the more we are equipped i believe that the word is equipped we need to be equipped and prepare you know, one of the things I did well, now that you mentioned AI immediately was I thought I went in that direction when I was doing my research. And, you know, when I first came across this uh, this topic, um, uh, Professor Lawrence, when you submitted the request, uh, was Google the word war, you know, and see if there had, and, you know, if there were any changes anywhere else. Not that I could read Russian, um, but I, I wanted to make sure, like, what is this something that is actually already happening, you know, like, uh, uh, in the bigger picture right with google but um we did we did clarify that it was very uh location based very specific um to to where google was actually operating in russia which i believe uh, if i if i have this correctly it's something to do with the law that um that they have to in order to do business there right they do you guys know what the, that the name of that law is um they had to yes alvaro yeah uh i don't know how to pronounce it in in, in russian but in english <laughs> it's uh, fakes law with an S, F A K E S. Uh, basically, oh, no, I'm sorry, that that's the the, the the censorship law. There's another law with uh, telecommunication uh, uh, companies, where if you want to have, uh, if you need to to do business, if you want to do business in Russia, uh, you need to have uh, an HQ within the the country, and right. hire people from Russia. So. Yeah, it adds a lot of, um, you know, permanence to your to your business side of things uh, when you're forced by the government to do so. Right. So that means that these are these were translators that were, you know, in that specific region, in that specific area. Such interesting. What a 
fascinating discussion, everyone. I'd like to uh, kind of give uh, the opportunity for our panelists to speak on, on anything further that they'd like to add with regards to d this discussion, anything that's prevalent that potentially, you know, you would like to share with today's audience or later on for our podcast audience. Professor Lawrence, uh, Professor Cristiano, please. I was just going to say, you know, moving forward, going back to this idea of what do we do moving forward, and Lohans was uh, uh, very clear about this idea of seeking knowledge, right? Uh, Mireya, you as well went to do research. Um, and we also need to think about translation and interpreting as a combination, a collection of different skills that we develop. Uh, over time as we are working in the field and also as we are learning, educating ourselves. One in particular that is very closely related to this dilemma is decision making. Mm. Decision making is a skill uh, mm. that gets developed over time and it only gets developed once you are exposed to dilemmas and have to critically engage with it. So, you know, um, trainings and, and, you know, it doesn't have to be at the university level, but, you yeah. know, a, a training that does engage students with uh, ethics at this level uh, are very important as well. Most definitely. Absolutely. Being engaged in the profession and the topics that are uh, prevalent out there in the industry is uh, so important, I think, and, and educating ourselves to help educate others as well, because I think that's that's one of the things that I uh, appreciate about this platform is having the opportunity to learn as I go, learning from professionals such as yourselves, uh, Professor Lawrence, Professor Cristiano, and the students that are part of these programs and what they're unraveling and putting out there. Um, there isn't much content out there unfortunately, at least not on our end um, uh, with regards to this specific topic, but the fact that it was even an issue and that it was, you know, someone said something, right, and it was it was brought to light. Uh, any other closing thoughts that you guys would like to add? I'm going to uh, go ahead and show uh, another comment here from our live audience today, which uh, is Nelly that says that the problem she sees in many places is that ethics ha uh, have been redefined. Uh, so we think and should be it's not for others or it's not existent. So uh, the ethics have been redefined. So we're thinking that it's not it's not for others or that it's not existent. Um, is that what you meant, uh, Nelly? That we're, that's those are the thoughts. Go ahead, Alvaro. Uh, that's my aunt, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tia. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, no, uh, I agree with her. Um, thinking about it with from a cultural like viewpoint, uh, we have different priorities with different cultures. Like, for example, as you may know, Mireya and Professor Matze. Here in South America, everyone is very, very uh, have, have family as a priority versus in other places where they might not. It, it might just be a second thought, thought or not not as, you know, hard, uh, a hard issue within the family, within the, the culture. So that's another point, like we're becoming more global. Uh, like I myself have been changing uh, my perspective after uh, engaging with people from different parts of the world. So. Mm -hmm. It's, it's something that is evolving right now. So I think we need to look for both, for both uh, a way to, in, in the main diagram of, of ethics, having your, your, social, um, your social ethics, your human ethics, your professional ethics, all be within that Venn diagram and not, uh, and not outside of that. Uh, just, you know, just like I said, as we are people um, that speak, speak both languages and usually are between two, to different uh, circles, we usually uh, are the only ones that have all the info. So we have to be very neutral in our stance and very, very well educated about it too, you know, yeah. to take the same. Yeah, and I think, you know, going back to the whole uh, notion of, of ensuring that we are 
um, putting ourselves out there in the sense of, you know, getting training and information and, and basically taking in, um, you know, situations such as this, it, it places us in that position of what would I do at least, right? Should a circumstance like this be presented to me as a professional interpreter, translator, what could I do? And it gives you the opportunity to place yourself, um, you know, firsthand in, in, in potentially a situation like this and, and at least hypothetically, uh, come up with some sort of solution or, you know, what you would be doing in that place. Today's discussion was a fascinating discussion. I think this topic, again, I go back to uh, agreeing with the Ron, many teeth, we could have gone into so many directions, you know, technology, the workforce, um, you know, the, the ethical principles, of course, that in itself, uh, and many other things. Um, I'd like to point out that according to uh, recent articles, Google did begin pulling out employees out of Russia, and they shared the following comment. Um, and I quote, our policies prohibit content denying minimizing or trivializing well-documented violent events, including Russia's invasion in Ukraine, end of quote. So I'd like to thank today's guests, uh, Alvaro Cepeda, Laurent Esaú, Professor Lawrence, and Director Cristiano Macei, all from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, for coming on this platform today and sharing your stories and your experiences. Thank you very much for being here today. I very much appreciate you. Um, and with that, I say farewell, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you thank for having us. Thank, thank you, you for having us. Yes. Thank you very thank much, you. Miriam. What's wonderful. Much. Absolutely. All right, guys. As we uh, head on over to the conclusion of today's live podcast episode, um, I just want to let you know that the Brand the Interpreter podcast was created specifically for sharing your stories about our profession. So thank you so much for joining me today for our first live podcast. And if you'd like to connect with me, please feel free to go to my website at www brandtheinterpreter.com and feel free to connect. That's all I have for you today. We'll see you again next time. So till then, and I hope you tune in to uh, this week's episode. This particular episode will launch in a future date. So stay tuned for that um, for all the podcast um, listening audience. I want to also take the opportunity to thank those of you that showed up here um, uh, online, uh, live to this event for our live audience. Really, thank you. It, it means the world to know that um, there are people out there connecting with the content. So thank you so very much for the opportunity. Take care, guys. We'll see you then. And uh, till next time.